All right, welcome to chapter four, part one on cell structure. We're gonna take a look at, at cells in general and then look at cell size, look at microscopes that we use to see cells. And then we'll finish off this section uh, introducing prokaryotic cells. Um, first, let's, let's take, a, take a quick recall back to chapter one. And remember that when we think about the properties that living things have, one of them was order. And when we looked at order, we, we considered the hierarchy of organization. And, and cells was a special level because the cell level was the first level in that hierarchy where all the properties of life existed. Down before that, we didn't have all those properties. And then we use cells in multicellular organisms to make tissues and put tissues together to make organs, organs together to make an organ system, and then multiple organ systems to form the organism. So cells are the fundamental units of life, um, and they're the building block of all organisms. We don't know of anything alive in our world that isn't composed of cells. If, if it's a single-celled organism, like, like all the way over in the right on C, um, these what look like large, large fuzzy yellow uh, short curved rods are vibrios, and this is a bacteria, uh, Vibrio tasmaniensis, um, and I don't know what the stuff is connecting them. These could be these could be flagella, or it could be uh, just junk that's on the slide. But it could be a single cell, and, and if that's a single-celled organism, that's all it has is a single cell. In a multicellular organism, like this is this is uh, sinus cells from a human, so this would be the cells that are found inside your nose. Um, you see the many cells together to make the tissue. Um, here we're looking at, at onion cells, and you can tell they're plant cells because they're rigidly packed together. Their cell walls are tight to each other. You can see the nuclei. Um, I don't know if this is, I'm guessing because there aren't any chloroplasts present, this isn't from a leaf or a stem. This is probably from the bulb of the onion, what we call a corm. But, but you know, whether you're single-celled or multicellular, cells are the building block. Now, cell size varies. Um, most of the time, cells are too small to be seen by the naked eye, or, or maybe to say seen, seen with the naked eye with detail. And in about the 1600s, mid to late 1600s, humans learned to grind glass to make lenses. And once they made lenses, they were able to magnify. And over time, we've learned to put various lens combinations together and use different types of light or electron beams to carry the image of the specimen. And, and able to, to make things much bigger so that we can see them. And, and, you know, this is a light microscope, A is, similar to what we use in the lab. Um, it's a little bit different. It's dated. You know, this is obviously an older model, but the, the, the overall technology hasn't changed significantly. This happens to have a C-mount. This is a C-mount, which allows you to put a camera or, or uh, you know, some other projector type um, apparatus on there. This is an electron microscope and you can see the size difference is enormous. Price difference is pretty high too. The labs we or the scopes we use in the lab, if I buy one of them, they're fifteen hundred to seventeen hundred dollars, depending on where I buy it. Um, if I buy thirty of them the price comes down. Um, this is an electron microscope. New it might go for three or four million dollars. Um, it's huge. It's it's probably sitting. See the pad it's sitting on. This is probably um, a special foundation that's going to minimize you know shock waves from tremors in the Earth's crust or let's say a big truck goes by the building, and and you got to have that when you're working with a piece of equipment this that uses this kind of detail. Um, if we look at at Salmonella, these tiny purple dots on this slide are salmonella bacteria that we'd see in the light microscope. When we look at them through an electron microscope, and this is a scanning electron microscope, now you can see those bacteria, and, and this is probably a human macrophage. Um, you have macrophages as part of your immune system that are coursing around looking for things that don't belong, and when they find them, they engulf them or phagocytize them, and that's what's happening here. And then once these are engulfed, this amoeba, or this macrophage, excuse me, functions like an amoeba, is going to fully digest these and, and that's what part of your immune system does. Uh, when, we, when we start using microscopes there's two parameters that immediately come to mind in magnification and resolving power and while they're related they're very different from each other. Magnification is just you know making something bigger or you could make it smaller. The image in the middle of this, I believe it's a moth because it has fuzzy antenna, um, but the image in the middle is, is normal, normal size, one to one, 
um, not magnified. Um, here they've actually reduced the image by one half, and over here they've increased it by, by five times, made it five times bigger. And you can certainly see detail over here that's very hard to see on, on, on just normal size. And that's, that's one of the advantages of magnification. But magnification without resolution, um, and you end up with a, a really fuzzy specimen and it's hard to really see what's, what's going on. Uh, radiolarians, are, radiolarians are marine organisms, live in the ocean, and they're a single-celled organism that's much like an amoeba. Um, they move by pseudopodial movement. They just kind of extend part of their cell out in any one direction, usually to get food. And, and what they do to protect themselves from predation is they make this case that they live inside. And the case is made out of silica, you know, it's basically sand. And when we look at a, a light microscope image of our radiolarian, you know, we, we can see it, but we don't really see the detail. It isn't until we look at it under an electron microscope that resolution really jumps out. Now, some authors define resolving power as the ability to distinguish when, when one point actually becomes two different things. Um, another way that I like to, to define resolution is the smallest object you can see clearly and distinctly. And you can, you can really see the resolution pop out here with the electron microscope. Now we can see the pores in the silica case. We can see the, the pseudopods reaching out through these to try to bring in food. That, just, that detail just isn't evident here with a light microscope. Um, the scope we use in the lab is a light microscope or a bright field microscope. And, and what we do is we blast the subject with light, the, the specimen with light, and, and the specimen ends up being darker than the background. But oftentimes, cells are transparent and light blows right through them. So a lot of times, you know, these are human cheek cells, and what they've done is they've stained them to highlight the cell and make it contrast with the background. You can see the large nucleus. Um, we can basically make out little tiny specks of bacteria on the surface. Um, a differential interference contrast microscope, by contrast, um, uses two beams of light that are out of phase with each other. And, and now look at the incredible detail we're seeing on the inside of a cell. All right, we can see really good detail with the cell organelles. We can see cilia around the perimeter of this paramecium. Um, dark field microscopy, instead of a beam of light, uses a hollow cone of light which illuminates the specimen from the side. So the background is dark and the specimen ends up being stained lighter. And this, this is a diatom that we're looking at. And you can see how, how by, by lighting it up and keeping the background dark, we start to see some really neat structures on the inside that normally wouldn't be apparent in a light, light microscope. So how we're, and, and there are many, many more microscopes besides these. We're just touching on a few. Um, many are, are, are used in special circumstance. For example, fluorescent microscopes are, are heavily used in immunology studies where we can tag uh, antibodies um, with fluorescent dyes or fluorescent proteins and we hit them with UV light and they glow a certain color. So there are different applications for the different scopes. Um, electron microscopes, we get um, both higher magnification and better res resolution because instead of a beam of light, we're using a beam of electrons. But as you can imagine, that creates a lot of problems with its in, a, in and of itself. Um, the very least is that um, these things are super expensive. We will never have a scope like this at mid. Uh, Central has a couple. Um, they, they're you know, super expensive. You, gotta, you and I wouldn't go up to an electron microscope and create an image or a micrograph with it. Um, instead, we would give our specimen to a technologist and, or a technician, and they would use our specimen, prepare it, and then they would mount it on the, on the scope and they would create the image. There's two basic types of electron microscope, uh, TEM or transmission electron microscope, and SEM or scanning electron microscope. Uh, the TEM, what we're going to do is we're going to take our specimen and we're going to embed it in amber, which is fossilized tree sap. And then we're going to use a, a blade called a microtome and slice that into ultra-thin uh, cross-sections, roughly 20 to 60 nanometers in, in thickness. And then we're going to hit it with the electron beam. This, this magnifies 10,000 10, to 100,000 times. And we get resolution down around 2.5 nanometers. And we see incredible detail in each slice. Now, we can run all the different slices into a computer. The computer can put them together to generate a three-dimensional image. 
a scanning electron microscope looks at the surface of an organism. So we see a 3D exterior view. And we're going to coat the specimen with a heavy metal stain. We're going to hit it with a, an electron beam. And what's going to happen is the electrons are going to hit and they're going to bounce off at whatever angle they hit on. If you've ever made a bank shot playing pool, then you understand the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. And then we put uh, electron... Uh, capturing devices around the specimen and they capture these scattered electrons and that creates an image on a, on a monitor or on a TV screen. Here you see the same paramecium but look at the, the arrangement of the cilia on the outside. It's just completely covered with cilia. We can see the oral groove where it, it funnels food into this. It acts like a gullet or a mouth to bring food in. Just incredible resolution and detail that we can see of the surface. What uh, our understanding of cells, and, and as we've, we've studied organisms and, and their composition, um, we've developed something called cell theory over time. And this was first suggested by a, a German, Rudolf Virchow, in the um, late 1800s. And, and what he said was cells are the basic units of life, and that all living cell organisms are made of cells, and all cells come from pre-existing cells. And this is certainly true in the, in the world we live in today. We are not aware of any living organisms that are not made of cells. And all cells that we're aware of have come from pre-existing cells. Um, but maybe our definition of life isn't complete. Maybe, maybe over time we're going to learn that there are other life forms that are not composed of cells. But in the meantime, this is, this is, the, this is cell theory. And remember, theories in, in science are based on many, many observations, many, many experiments, proving many, many hypotheses true. But all it takes is one hypothesis, hypothesis to be proved false, and we have to amend our theory, which, which is a good thing about science. You know, if we're wrong, we can fix it to better reflect the truth. Um, there's a reason cells are small. Uh, and that's because, you know, first, it's got to be big enough to hold everything inside the cell that the cell's going to need to survive, um, interact with the environment, and then reproduce itself. But they have to be small enough that they allow surface, uh, you know, allow exchange with the environment. You know, we have to be able to get nutrients into the cell and easily disperse them throughout the cell. And then we have to be able to collect waste materials in the cell and move them to the edge to get them out of the cell. And, and as cells get bigger, it's harder and harder to do that. Now, one way cells can get big but avoid those limitations is by having long, thin extensions. And here in this amoeba, you can see that the main part of the cell is kind of, kind of this blobular shape. But again, it can form these pseudopods. And as it extends these and becomes longer and thinner, it lowers its surface area to volume ratio, and that makes it easier for nutrients and waste to be uh, dispersed into and out of the cell. You have, you have some neurons or nerve cells in your body that are almost a yard long, meter long, that extend from your, your backbone, your spine, down to the tips of your toes and back. Um, one long, thin cell, but the way they can do it is by having really, really thin extensions that, that allow that high surface area to volume ratio to, meet, to stay intact. And, and you can, we can model this. If, if we take a cube, if we take a cube, that's one centimeter on length, width, and height, then each side is one times one, or one square centimeter, and there are six of those. So it has a surface of six times one, or six square centimeters. Its volume is one times one times one, which is one cubic centimeter. If we double the size of the sides, then two times two is four, six times four is 24 square centimeters, two times two times two is eight, now, 8 goes into 24 three times, so this is a 3 to 1 surface area to volume ratio. So by, by doubling the size, we cut the surface area to volume ratio in half. And as we make our, our cube bigger and bigger, we continue to lower that surface area to volume ratio. Eventually, the cell would be so large that it can't distribute nutrients and remove waste efficiently, and then the cell's not going to survive. 
if we look at you know relative sizes of you know bacteria or prokaryotic cells, uh, animal cells, uh, and plant cells, and then some other structures like a human egg, a, a frog egg, chicken, ostrich egg, um, we can see that you know bacteria cells are fairly small down here on the one micrometer range. Some cocci are about a half of a micrometer in diameter. Uh, some some bacteria are really big, like the Sprill and volutans we looked at in the lab is up here around 40 micrometers in length. You know, so this is this isn't true of every cell, but on average, you know, prokaryotic cells, bacterial cells, are much smaller than animal and plant cells, and we can see them with our light microscope. We can certainly see them with an electron microscope, okay, but probably not with our naked eye. When we when we think about cells, there are four common components that all cells have. Um, a plasma membrane, which is really important because we need to separate the cell, what's inside the cell from the external environment. And then inside the cell, there's going to be a um, substance called cytoplasm, which is, is mostly liquid cytosol, which is mostly water. And then uh, within that is going to be the DNA, which is the genetic material of the cell. So this is how, how we, we can code for whatever products the cell can make, how we code for, for proteins that allow the cell to respond to the environment. And then that's the information we have to copy to pass on to, to offspring. And then finally, we're going to need to make proteins because they're the workhorses of the cell. Um, ribosomes do that. So these are the four things that all cells are going to have. Again, the plasma membrane, really important structure. Without a plasma membrane, you don't have a cell. Um, it's a phospholipid bilayer, so you can see that there's, there's really two layers here. There's, there's a layer up top, and there's a layer on the bottom. If you remember phospholipids from um, the, the first part or the second part of chapter two, um, you remember that they have that polar head, which interacts with water, and the nonpolar tails that won't. Hydrophilic, hydrophobic region. And so anything that can interact with the hydrophilic head has trouble getting past the hydrophobic tail. And anything that can interact with the hydrophobic tail might have trouble getting to it through the hydrophilic head. And so now we can very easily maintain the integrity of whatever's inside the cell versus whatever's outside the cell. Now some things are small enough to diffuse through, like water or gases, like oxygen or carbon dioxide. Other things are going to need to be transported through, and there are special proteins that are associated with the, the membrane that act as, as channels or that can, can physically move, transport something through. But there are many functions for these membrane proteins. We'll see a few more in the next, in the next video. Um, just, you know, there's, there's so many, fun, you know, sometimes they act as recognition sites and identify the cell to other cells. They act as binding sites for, for nutrients that need to get into the cell, or this is how viruses know which cell to, to target by binding to a specific protein on the surface. Uh, just, there's many, many functions of proteins. Some on the inside are enzymes that catalyze biochemical reactions. Um, this is an animal cell membrane. You can see the cholesterol that's in the tail region, and they've really underrepresented that. Normally, um, about 20% of that tail region is cholesterol in an animal cell, and that's what gives our, our cell membrane strength and keeps us from tearing, but it's still flexible enough for us to move. The membrane is semi-permeable. Some things get through, some things don't, and it's said to be fluid meaning that the things that are in a layer can move around within that layer, they just can't cross layers very easily. Cytoplasm is, again, a gel-like substance. It's mostly water. Um, it, it's going to have whatever organelles are in the cell. It's going to have the DNA that's in the cell, especially prokaryotic cell, which is what we're starting with, 78% um, water. But it's also going to have all the raw materials, the monomers and polymers, that the cell's going to need to to uh, grow and maintain and reproduce. So it's going to have monosaccharides. It's going to have fatty acids and glycerol. It's going to have um, ions. It's going to have gas molecules. It's going to have uh, amino acids and nucleotides and phosphate and all the things it's going to need to build the complex carbohydrates, the lipids, the proteins and nucleic acids that the cell is going to need. It's also going to have waste that's on its way out of the cell, but hasn't been, been removed yet. And in many ways, this is this is like think think of your apartment or of the house you live in. You know, do you have do you have nutrients? Do you have food that you have in your house that you're not going to use today, and you may not use it next week or next month? You know, I I bought a side of beef a while ago, 
and it's taken us two years to work through three quarters of it and there's still a fair amount there and as long as the freezer doesn't break down knock on wood um you know it's going to be be, be eat perfect to use whenever we get around to to cooking it up um in 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 your house or 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 wherever you live do you have waste that you know you're not going to run out to the dumpster every time you have something that's that's disposable turn up you, you know we have we have a waste basket in the kitchen we have one in each bathroom there's one in several in the garage um when there's enough we combine them and we take them to the dumpster um, we, in some places we have recyclables, other places we have returnables. There are places where magazines and paper pile up until we can recycle it. Um, and, and the same thing is true in the cell. You're going to have places in the cytoplasm where materials accumulate until the cell can get rid of them. Um, and, and the cytoplasm is a dynamic environment. And what that means is, is its composition is constantly changing. And the reason is because the environment is constantly changing. And so the cell has to change what it what it has inside to keep up with the environment. DNA, DNA is really important to cells because this is where we store the hereditary information. This DNA is going to code for proteins. Some of it's going to be regulatory and, and control when a cell makes particular proteins or how it makes them um, in response to the environment. DNA is double-stranded. In prokaryotic cells, it's circular big circle. Um, in, it's linear in, in our cells, in eukaryotic cells, long thin lines. Um, remember too, prokaryotes also could have plasmids, which are small circular DNA with non-essential genes. The genes on the chromosome are essential. Cells got to have these to survive. Doesn't necessarily need the genes on the plasmids. Interesting thing about plasmids is they can be passed to other bacteria, other prokaryotes, through structures called pili that are hollow straw-like structures on the surface. Two cells can fuse their pili, the plasmid can go from one to the other, and now both cells have a copy of the plasmid. This is a, a real problem with antibiotic resistance. Oftentimes, the genes associated with proteins that provide antibiotic resistance are on plasmids. And so as we have bacteria developing, you know, evolving, mutating to generate antibiotic resistance, not only are they now immune to that antibiotic, but they can pass it on to other bacteria, and this can happen across species lines. This is why we have to be very careful with how we use antibiotics. Finally, ribosomes is the last thing that all, all cells have in common. Um, ribosomes are, are made of RNA and proteins. They're uh, two different subunits that, when they're not making proteins, are separated from each other. And we're going to see in a much later chapter when we look at, at how, how uh, information is used in a cell and how cells build proteins, we're going to see how the ribosome will read a piece of what's called messenger RNA, which is carrying a, a, a copy or transcription of the gene and uses that to build this growing polypeptide chain of amino acids. We'll see this process later. For now, it's, it's enough for you to understand that ribosomes are the organelle that's responsible for building proteins or protein synthesis. Now, the smallest cells are prokaryotic cells, and these are found in both domains archaea and bacteria. Remember, there were three domains. Domain archaea, where we find um, organisms living typically in extreme habitats. They have a unique biochemistry that allows them to live there. Uh, domain bacteria, which is, is, is probably the most diverse domain. It's, if, if there's a way to make a living on planet Earth, there's probably an organism in domain bacteria that can do it. But both of these groups are prokaryotic organisms. Domain eukarya, which we'll see in the next, we'll, we'll introduce in the next lecture, um, is, is made of eukaryotic cells, and that includes the plants, the animals, the fungi, and then the proteas, the uh, protozoans and algae and slime molds and lichen and water molds and a few other organisms that don't fit nicely anywhere else. Um, reason for the small size of prokaryotic cells, because it gives them a, a greater surface area to volume ratio. And now it's easier for them to move material in and out of the cell. They're a simple cell. They simply don't need all the modifications that large eukaryotic cells need. This is a, this is a micrograph from a light microscope. This is a human cheek cell that's been stained to highlight the nucleus, but it also is highlighting bacteria on the surface. And you can see there are, there are hundreds of bacteria on the surface of the cell. 
the cell is thousands of times, you know, this is, cell's not flat, it's three-dimensional. So it's thousands of times bigger than any of these individual bacteria. They're tiny compared to the large, large cell. The bigger a cell is, the more it has to have specialized structures. These tiny bacterial cells, they don't, they don't need that. Um, because of that, because of their simplistic nature, many scientists believe that either prokaryotes were the first cells or prokaryotes were the first ancestors of the first cells. Um, prokaryotes lack membrane-enclosed internal compartments. This is going to be important to us because what we're going to find out later is that a lot of biochemical activity happens around specialized membrane. And, and so by having a lot of membrane-bound organelles, eukaryotic cells can have far more specialized um, biochemical activity than prokaryotes have. Um, and most bacteria also are going to, especially domain bacteria, are going to have a cell wall outside of their cell membrane. So here's the plasma membrane, and then one type of bacteria and domain bacteria has a very thick layer of this, this uh, it's part protein, part carbohydrate called peptidoglycan. A different type of bacteria has a thin layer of peptidoglycan and a second membrane, okay? So this, this is considered the whole outer cell wall, inner membrane, cell wall, inner membrane. Different from each other, but one thing they have in common is the peptidoglycan. Um, there are other structures external to the cell. Uh, many prokaryotes have a, th a sticky outer layer of polysaccharides called a capsule. And because it's sticky, the capsule allows the cell to attach. And in, if you can attach and you find yourself in a favorable environment, you don't have to move to get nutrition. And that's a benefit for the organism. Having a sticky capsule also makes it harder for you to be removed. There are, there are several bacteria that form capsules that are associated with human disease because it's hard for our immune system to get rid of them because their capsule helps them to stick in a favorable location. Uh, many bacteria have flagella, which are long whip-like organelles of locomotion. And, and again, we talked a little bit about pili. <clears throat> Excuse me. Many bacteria have pili, they're hollow tube-like structures that allow them to transfer plasmids from one bacterial cell to another. That's a process is called conjugation, and it's kind of a type of sexual activity. And then finally, many bacteria have fimbriae, which are solid, um, solid structures, but they're short and numerous, and they allow the cell to physically attach to some structure on a host cell. Um, and so let's say that there's a, an organism who wants to live in your urethra, which is it's a hard place to live because when urination occurs, there's intense flushing. Well, if I, if I have fimbriae and I can take the end of my fimbriae and fuse it to a protein on the surface of the, of the epithelial cells lining the urethra, now I physically become a part of those cells and I can't be flushed away. And so fimbriae are really important for, for microbes that live in, in uh, environments where there's intense flushing. Once we get inside the prokaryotic cell, so, so again, we've, I think we've pretty well covered it. We, on the outside, we've got um, possibly a flagella, possibly pili, possibly fimbriae, possibly a capsule. Not every prokaryote has all those, but many do have all those. On the inside, I've got my cell wall, my cell membrane, I've got my cytoplasm, my DNA, and, and I've got my ribosomes. And, and those are the main structures, <clears throat> excuse me, in a prokaryotic cell wall. Um, we might talk about the nucleoid region. That's wherever the chromosome is. Wherever the circular chromosome is, is called the nucleoid or the nucleoid region. Um, there's, but there's no membrane holding the chromosome. You really don't need it. There's just one, and it's circular. All right, so that's pretty much the end of this, this uh, section of Chapter 4. Here are the key terms that you should be familiar with for the exam. And here are the key concepts that um, we'll use when we write the exam. Um, make sure you can, you can, if you can understand these from memory, you're ready for the exam.